for the people that don't know, I'm going to try in a very quick way um, to sort of uh, get you an idea of what it's about. But it's not so much about the color, because this is the color teal, blue-green. It's also a duck who has blue-green feathers. So it has two meanings in English. Um, and it has to do with, uh, especially with the principles behind this color, uh, which I will try and, and explain to you. Um, we're living in, a, in quite a VUCA, and I put, put the P behind it, VUCA world. It's very volatile, as you probably know. It's very uncertain at, at this moment in time, very complex, constantly becoming more and more complex, ambiguous and very polarized. Look at what the refugee crisis in Europe brought us, how for and against and whatever. Uh, look at America, where at this moment in time there's, there's a total polarization about Trump and Clinton and, and whatever. Uh, and it's getting worse and worse. Now the question is, should we really keep on doing this? Because we're dividing people instead of unifying uh, people. In the last 30, 20, 30 years, it, there has been a, a tsunami of uh, technolo technological and communi communicative um, evolution. Very, very fast, very easy. Uh, we are sort of, we even adapt very easily to it. And our kids, they get born with it, so they don't know anything else. We had a phone, which you really had still to dial. They just get born and start using their thumb, you know? Well, maybe in, in a few years' time that will be the case. Um, so this has happened in a, in a very short time. Uh, the internet, this is the reason why I'm here. If we wouldn't have internet, I probably would have never met Anna. Uh, I wouldn't be able to communicate to people all over the world, talking about this, but also about other things. So we, are have, we, we have the virtual world getting more and more mixed up with our real world at this moment in time, which is, has a lot of good things, of course. And then on an organizational level, we're still doing this. You might read the text. I didn't make this myself. You can find it on the internet. But the text says, when top, top, top levels, let's say this happens in about 90, 95% of organizations, the old school organizations, of course. You have, luckily, new organizations who are already quite um, you know, vibrant in looking for new ways of working together. And this is what, we, what people do still. You know, look down on people and also look on their own shit. And what people do on the, at the bottom level is look up and what do they see? Um, you can have a look at this. Om 7 uur gaat de wekker. We sleuren ons uit bed en we gaan naar ons werk. Dat doen we gemiddeld 45 jaar van ons leven en al sinds de uitvinding van de lopende band. Niemand wil dat. Wij niet, want het maakt ons ziek, ongelukkig en ongemotiveerd. En onze werkgevers al helemaal niet, want het gaat ten koste van opbrengst en productiviteit. Ons werk en de technologie die we daarbij gebruiken zijn de afgelopen eeuw ingrijpend veranderd. Wordt het dan niet ook tijd voor nieuwe vormen van organiseren? Waarin we zelf bepalen hoe, wanneer en waar we werken. En als we dat gaan doen, wat betekent dat voor de rol van de manager? Het is allemaal begonnen in de 19e eeuw. Met de komst van de fabrieken. Leidinggevenden waren er voor het denken en medewerkers voor het doen. In die tijd leek dat een handig systeem, want arbeiders werden gezien als domme krachten. Het idee bestond dat die probeerden zo langzaam mogelijk te werken, terwijl ze de baas het gevoel gaven dat de productie lekker opschoot. Zulke medewerkers hadden beslist een oplettende manager nodig die vertelde wat ze moesten doen. Dat principe werd zelfs geperfectioneerd in een wetenschappelijk model, scientific management. Mensen kregen specifieke taken en vervolgens werd gecontroleerd of ze het wel goed deden. Als ze snel en nauwkeurig werkten, kregen ze een bonus. En dat werktempo werd dan de norm voor iedereen. In die tijd kon dat misschien. Maar werkt dit systeem nog steeds in onze huidige kenniseconomie? Waarbij we van arbeiders meer verwachten dan spierbundel zijn. 
This is the key. We are not living in a hundred years ago anymore, where labor was actually very hard labor, where people came from, from the countryside working in cities and factories and also needed to be guided within these new factories on how to do things. Because on, on the country, in the countryside, they had sort of a bit of leeway and were, were quite free in, in getting results. Uh, and if it wasn't today, it was maybe tomorrow. So they sort of needed to be uh, a bit triggered in that. And that's why management was sort of, uh, I won't say found out, but had its entrance. No? Now, scientific management... Uh, we can have a discussion about this, of course, and, and Mr. Taylor, who invented it, um, based his findings on one experiment, very short, actually, um, and it wasn't that scientific because he sort of had guided the results towards his own ideas. So you can still ask, was this? But what has happened since is that our whole society has been based on this. Schooling, the government, whatever else, and we... It has brought us to where we are now. We are very, we're living in, in prosperous, we have had prosperous times, of course, and still, still are. Uh, but maybe it's not working anymore because we have this, the knowledge society. We have the internet. We can, young children can get knowledge just like that. We needed to have the, the teacher that taught us. These guys look up things and just find, know more possibly than, than the teacher teaching it. So we might have to look at different ways of uh, working together in the future. Um, these ideas are not actually that new. You could say even a few thousand years ago, working on human base with each other was talked about by Plato and by Aristotle and by Lao Tse, for instance. Now this lady is sort of the, uh, let's say, the founder of the humanistic ideas within uh, organizations. She was actually the inspirer for Alton Mayo, who had a Hawthorne experiment in the States and who sort of looked at uh, having a good working environment instead of the factories that we, we've just seen. No? So she was sort of uh, quite holistic already in that time. And we're talking in the, in the, 20, in the years 20. No? Um, so our ideas are not that new. The only thing is that maybe the time now is better than it used to be. And she was also a woman in that age, which made it more, even more difficult. And at this moment in time, luckily, it, it, it's not the case anymore. Um, who knows this person? Douglas McGregor is a guy who wrote a book, uh, The Human Side of Enterprise, in the 60s, and talked about theory Y and theory X. Theory X is the old way of thinking that people need leadership, need guidance, need, are lazy to start with, don't want to work, actually. And he says theory Y is actually the, the opposite, where people do want to be valued, valued and want to be part of this, you know, uh, organization that reaches success. Now, why is it that we don't really evolve as fast as technology, for instance? Who knows Mr. Samler, Ricardo Samler? Okay. Uh, he was a Brazilian, he's a Brazilian guy. I had a chance to talk to him a few weeks ago, uh, which was a wonderful conversation, actually. He started asking me questions for about 50 minutes, and I had a chance to ask him too, so <laughs> that's, that's nice, of course. Um, he has a company who he reformed in the 80s already, made it very democratic, where people can actually choose their own wages. Um, sounds a bit strange, no? Choose, may, decide our own wages, our own bonuses, our own whatever. But it works. He became, the, the Semco company became very, very successful and grew and grew and grew up to 7,000 people. And you know what he did? He put it down again and there's now working 80, 80 people. And for the, for the rest, about 60% of them became self-employed with money of the company, with means of the company and delivering to the company. So he made them as, uh, richer as well, not only in money, but also in uh, being part of the, of the society, of course. Now, he's going to tell you why it is that we change so uh, uneasy. When we think about the Industrial Revolution and what it generated, basically a hundred and something years ago, in 1908, you had the first assembly line in place by Henry Ford, a Taylorist system. That 
assembly line logic is what we're following to this day. There's no difference there with what we do with our kids at school. We're trying to put millions of kids through a system of give them biology one, biology two, mathematics this, trigonometry, sine and cosine, and send them off into the workplace. The workplace takes them and says, okay, now you're gonna work two years here, four years here, and you're So we've boxed in the whole system in the assembly line logic, which is still here. But if you're still collecting the past and looking to the past as a solution, having history as a very strong anchor, uh, you're unable to move forward because there are historical reasons why our tribe of humanity is such a slow changer, because change is very, very uh, scary. And human beings don't do scary things on their own. It, it takes something much bigger to force them into change. But uh, what kind of big thing could that be? For every human being individual, it's the heart attack, the car accident, the something that happened which was much bigger than you, which suddenly you wake up and say, oh my God, I've been spending all my life inside a box just working for someone else. Oh, isn't there a better way? For humanity in general, it is this, that suddenly it stops raining, suddenly uh, everything goes crazy and you can't control the climate, so that's big enough. If the world were hit by a meteorite, it would be enough. It takes enormous things like that. So we are a bit din dinosaurs in that sense, that we will roam around and do our thing until we're hit by something much bigger than us. And that's true even for the individual who needs a heart attack to wake up to find out that they've been working too much. I think everybody has had some um, down periods in, that, in our lives, no? Um, and do you know when, how you come out of that? after a down period, might take a while, but mostly you, you become stronger, hopefully. So you have a down period, and then you have an up period, and it's always higher than the top period before, even. Um, we're living in, are we living in an era of change or a change of era? What do you think? You can just talk, you know? <laughs> Who says the first? Era of change? Okay. Or change of era? Okay, you're hesitant, no problem. Um, it's both, actually. It's both. You know why? Because this is continuous. We continuously evolve and change, and technology becomes better and whatever. This is uh, only once in a while. This happened during the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, whatever else. Um, uh, there's somebody at the door there. <laughs> um, so the, I think we're in the middle of this now. What hap what's happening in our world makes it ready for a shift, for a big shift, actually. And we might even go through a period of chaos. We might even go through a lot of turmoil and a lot of hurt and a lot of people who are... Who are suffering maybe who they already are no i mean if look look at the refugees if you if you're in a country like iraq or syria and you need to flee your own home can you imagine that and you don't know where you're going to end up so we might be in that case as well and i'm not saying how you should react to that i'm not doing politics so it's not about that but i mean that's how it shows that we are sort of moving in that direction of course uh, there's also proof, a lot of proof out there that this, what, I'm, what we are trying to say is working teal, so to speak, uh, that it works. Working teal means working in a more humane way, in a more human-centric way, uh, more from the heart and from the brain, in a good balance, of course. A lot of examples have been written over the years. Uh, maybe not that much known, but they're getting there. We're getting there. And of course, this book has helped towards this. Mr. Townsend wrote in this, who was the CEO in the, in the 60s for Avis, who made it very uh, successful, did it in this way. Uh, Mr. Taylink of Harley Davidson in the 90s, maybe some of you remember that Harley Davidson was all over the place all of a sudden in the 90s. Well, this was because he did this in a human, in a human centric way, together with his employees, with his, with his co workers, so to speak. Even in the US Navy, they used this. Uh, let's say that this, these ideas to bring the bottom ships in the ranking up to the first place. Two captains actually wrote a book on this. 
Uh, this actually, Lars Collin, this Danish person who used to be the CEO of Oticon, which is now uh, quite well known for hearing aids all over the world. And Zappos, you can discuss about Zappos, but okay. Um, they started out doing this. And these two books, I'm going to light out a little bit, are sort of, have globalized uh, more than, I think the idea is that they researched was like in 40 f to 50 companies, and they sort of uh, grasped about 18 to 15 out of them uh, to then describe them in their book. Freedom Inc. is not that much known, more in the French world, in the southern part of Europe. Uh, we have, of course, in Flanders and, and, and Holland, we've, we've discovered, and, and in the Nordic countries, we've discovered reinventing organizations who became very popular all over the world at this moment in time. But actually, Freedom Inc. is as good and was written five years even before that. It's, to my opinion, in my opinion, but that's also very personal, it's even better because it's much more readable as well. It's easy readable. And they also have one company which is similar, which is Favi. Actually, Frederick Lalou based his story of Favi on the book of Isaac Getz. So these companies are, have evolved towards Teal, maybe not fully, but that doesn't matter. You don't have to become fully Teal. You are on your way to evolve. Now, what is Teal? This, is, this you can find in the book. He talks about uh, our, soci our society and, and how it was built, how organizations came about in our society. You have the tribal period, the mystical period, and then you have like the red period, where, where you could actually say where power was like based on fear. And I think we all know examples of our days, of, uh, in our days as well, no? Then you have the amber, which is um, the army, police, like myself, the church, very rigid, very rules, a lot of rules and, and, and stuff like that, very structured based. You have the orange, which is uh, the machinal um, part, uh, let's say the industries, you know, the Taylorism that, that came about. You have the green, which is more family oriented, uh, which is actually, we have evolved towards that. One thing is very special about all these colors is that this color, this color pushes this away. This color pushes this away and says it's wrong. This color pushes the other way and says, oh, that's all wrong. And this color, teal, is embracing all the rest. Because the rest it still exists, you know? You can't just take it away. Now, it's also linked to spiral dynamics. Does anybody know spiral dynamics? Okay. They use different colors. But actually, Ken Wilbur, who this is based on, was actually a partner of Don Beck to start with. And then they sort of parted. And Ken Wilbur put different colors. In Spiral Dynamics, this is yellow. This is blue. But it doesn't really matter what color it is. It's about the principles behind it. Can you call it yellow, teal, whatever? Doesn't matter. More human, more human based. Now, which, which paradigm are we sort of at this moment in time, sort of, is, is society or, or our world uh, moving towards? Well, I think there's, at this moment, you can see three clear ways, which is this one, of course. We're all confronted with this, mostly, is that, especially if we've, we've had our, our, our bombings, um, and we're still very cautious on everything. Um, the, this is the modern crusades, no? sort of going back in time a little. Um, this is a red paradigm, nothing more, nothing less. It's like fear and making people hate each other. That's what it's about. Now, we can stay in the orange as well. Pokemon Go? Oh, yes, it connects us, just like this, you know? We talk to each other about Pokemons. I have nothing against the game, don't get me wrong. And it's probably nice for kids. They come out again, yes. With a little danger for their life, probably, because they don't pay attention to traffic, but okay. And it's okay that virtual worlds and, and the real world connect. But I think we should have a bit more framework into this, you know, because we make more sheep in this way. People are not alert anymore, like, or, or pay attention to each other. They're actually in their own little world, virtual world for, for a piece, for, for a side. <coughs> and they just walk around like sheep in a compound, no? In my opinion. This is only my opinion. So. Now, we try to aim for this, for a teal world, which is a better world. 
better in that sense that we take care of each other. As we have, as, as a species, that's what we are about. We take care of each other. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You, you have this inside you. All these ideas and principles are already there. You just need to trigger them. Or let's say some people need to trigger them to come out again. Apparently, you have already triggered yourself, so that's, that's quite good, of course. And it's about networking. It's about not hierarchies anymore, but networking. That's actually the basis for everything. So this is what Teal is about. It has three breakthroughs, paradigm breakthroughs, which is wholeness. Wholeness is being your true self in every occasion, in every situation. And that also means that you can accept your ego, if, that's, if that pops up once in a while. As long as you find the balance to sometimes say, OK, good enough. You've had your time, so now it's, again, me. Uh, evolutionary purpose. Every one of us has a purpose, a personal purpose. Now, what if your personal purpose can sort of be in balance with the purpose of the organization that you work for? That organization taking care of you and you taking care of the organization. Wouldn't that be great? And self-management is sort of a, for me, it's sort of a, an output of that. You know, it's, it's visible. Self-management is really visible. The other two are like, okay, we can talk about it, but it's not tangible. Um, and of course, there's a few principles behind that. Principles to me, there's only nine here, but there's much more to it, of course. Um, I could probably fill, a picture, fill, a, fill, a, fill this slide with maybe 20 pictures. But it's about authenticity, about integrity, about win-win thinking for everybody. Not only for me, not greediness, but just, you know, also try to give, to, uh, let, let others make some money as well or, or be successful or whatever. It's about equal value, not about equality, because we're not equal. We shouldn't be equal because, can you imagine that you're all like me? I mean, you know, um, it's about engagement towards each other, towards the organization, towards your environment. It's about respect, it's about human connection, what you find here when you see this energy. And it's about trust. This is the major word in this kind of thinking, trust. I don't even think it's very hard to give. You can give trust to people. It's up to them to live towards expectations. And if they don't do that, okay, you have distrust. But you can start with trust. That's not really that difficult. Now I have a, a few questions. We could call this an exercise, but the question is, in, in the end, is are we human doings or are we human beings? And which would you rather be? And the first question I normally ask towards managers and CEOs and people in charge and supervising roles, leading roles, what do you do all day? And I'm asking you the same. What do you do all day in a leading role? What kind of things would pop up? This one should be easy, actually. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Encourage mm -hmm. people. Empower people. Okay. Asking questions. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Finding stuff. Mm hmm. And finding stuff. Challenge. Mm hmm. Okay. Sensing oneself. That's already quite towards what we're talking about, no? I think you're also having a different culture than, than where I come from. We're still ri quite rigid in, in hierarchy, you know. I think the Nordic countries, luckily, have a bit more openness. To us. It starts with Holland to start with, and we look across this, the, the, the border, of course. So where I come from, it's much more about marketing and finance and making money and making profit and Excel sheets and whatever, flow charts. And so when I ask the questions there, this is what comes out. Here, it's, I, in, I asked the same questions in Stockholm, and this is the same uh, answers that I got. So I was quite surprised. Like, oh, they're already there somehow, you know? You're already, you're already in the right mindset, which is great, because it much, it's much more easy to, re to evolve in that way, of course. Now, what is the second question? And maybe this is a bit more difficult. What happens inside of you all day? And do we think about this? Do we look in, inside ourselves and talk about this even in open communication. Any reflections? Any thoughts? Hmm. 
positive and negative. Okay. Yeah. So what this is this question about actually? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the key word, feelings. It's about what you feel. You can feel anger, you can feel negative, like, like, Mr. S like your colleague said. Uh, you can feel good, you can feel happy. Monday morning, oh, I, need to, I can go to work. I don't know if it's the case for everyone, but okay. Um, so it's about feelings, but do we really share that with our colleagues? We share it with our partners, and we share it with our kids maybe, and whatever. And yet, in a place where we spend 75% of our time during our lives, we don't. And we work together with people. Okay, we might not always have chosen them ourselves, but we, do we choose family ourselves? Your partner you, cho you choose. But, okay, you need to work with these people. You need to go create. You need to have the, res the result. So why wouldn't you be able to Become your, be yourself, lay off your mask and say, you know what, I, don't, I feel like shit today. Excuse my language. And then people might ask you, well, why? Tell us why. And maybe we can so, sort of support you so that you become a bit better again, that you can you know, become more productive again, if that would be the case. So it's about looking inside yourself as well. Now, the third question it's about relating to other people. So what happens between you and other people all day? It's a question that I would put forward to these same managers. And that's when most people stop answering because they don't think about this. But what is our relationship with other people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you share with other people. Yeah. Communicating pressures and emotions. Emotions are already quite strong, no? I, th I feel. But I think also that a lot of the time, if you're not thinking too much about what happens inside of you, you just transfer something to the person. Exactly. And it might not be what you want to hear. Maybe you were just not the question in all kindness, but you're. Maybe stressed out because of the solitude. Yes. And you're angry, and that's what comes out. Very true. Yes. So this has actually been put in a model by Mr. Watkins, uh, who wrote a book. He, I wrote. I, this is the last book I read, and it's for, about 4D leadership. And you, you know, some people might know the, the 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 framework of Ken Wilber, where he says we have it, it, and then I and we. Well, actually, this is sort of based on this. Uh, everyday leadership. People in leadership positions look at the it. What are we doing? You know, and we need to do this and we need to do that. Now this and this is sort of forgotten. And they take it home and they talk to their wife with all consequences because what, whatever you take from home, whatever you take from work and you take it home might also clash with the person on the other side. So we don't pay attention to those kind of things. And that might be a problem. So that this, these kind of questions might trigger people to at least think about this. And that's actually what we are trying to do. I'm not trying to convince anybody. That's not my aim. My aim is to plant a seed and maybe people can think about it. And if you find something in there, you might nourish it and it, something can grow towards the better, so to speak. Um, also, especially when you sort of Ask yourself the question. You pro everybody does this. Uh, am I am I really okay? Am I doing well? Um, I f uh, my job is this really what I f feel good about and stuff like that. I think we all reflect, no? So this is this can actually help. Our life it looks a bit like this. Not like this because we think it might be linear. We come from purity to wisdom, just like that. No, this is the way that we run our lives or lead our lives. So that's what I talked about before, no? the, the, the down period, and then the up period, and the down period, and the up period. And you hope that one day you become that rich in, in your mind and feeling and whatever. And I've, I've sort of, I won't say I've reached it, but I'm on my way, and I've, I feel quite happy about that. Um, I've been here, and I've been here, but I've also been here, and now I'm probably here somewhere. It, and it hasn't ended yet, so I don't know where it might end up. I, I'm, I'm, 
who knows, you know. Um, but it starts with a personal transformation. And I'm, I can share that a little bit with you. When, when I was um, working in Ostend as a commissioner, um, I had these ideas sort of already quite a long time because I joined the senior officer's staff, so to speak, out of the idea if I, can't, if I can't beat him, maybe I should join him and then I can change things. Because I was one of these rebellious scoplers that, that talked to, uh, you know, that talked back to, to commissioners not saying hello to me. Because I thought this was basic uh, politeness to, to at least say hello to somebody, you know? And no, they just pass you and like, okay. So I just turn around sometimes and said like, hello to you too, you know? Um, but and you get you get a stamp on your back for that because ah, you're the you're the, the you're the naughty person, no. Um, so I wanted to change this, these kind of things, and, and I couldn't do it as, a, as the constable, as a, as a, as a road uh, or let's say a police, an, an ordinary policeman, so to speak. Um, so I became a senior officer, and I was drawn into this tube of having to create distance between people and standing above people and have look at your rank, what you achieved, and whatever. And did it feel right? No, but I went with it because I thought I knew nothing better. So on the 31st of, of, of uh, March 2000, 2000, I was just, a, uh, let's say, a head constable. And the 1st of April, I became a deputy commissioner. So the gap was immense. I didn't know what was, it, was it what was in between or how I should act. And I had to learn the hard way. And of course, some people took advantage of me, but that was only maybe 2% of the people I worked with. So I didn't focus on the 89, on the 98%. I focused on the 2% and then backed away and said, oh, I, you know, I can't mingle with them anymore. I can't go, ha go have a drink with them anymore. And that's actually exactly what, was t what, what I was told by my chief. He said, you need to create distance. Now, after a number of years doing this, I felt very bad about it. I went like, this is not right. We shouldn't do this. So I, and I had good contacts with the people on the street, and I talked to them a lot. And um, I found out that they were very unhappy and very disengaged, actually. And why? Because we had sort of created distance. We decided everything, and they were just executing because they, well, they were scared maybe to, to lose their job. So I was sitting at a staff meeting, and I heard my colleague say, you know what, there are a bunch, of, a bunch of lazy people and we need a new stick behind the door and we need to check on them even more and we need pr new procedures. And I, I couldn't believe my ears. I was like, are you serious? I've been talking to these people. They do a wonderful job. 95% of them do a wonderful job every day, even as small or, or little engaged that they still are. They are still finding this energy to do a good job towards the people, for the people. And you are putting, this, putting them in the same bag as the 5% that doesn't live up to expectations. And then you can even ask yourself the question, why, are, uh, why that 5% exists? Isn't it our fault? Because we made them disengaged? So I was sort of an out, I became an outcast myself. I was like, well, yeah, this doesn't work. I started talking about why not trust people and give them the, the, the freedom to act towards this. And I was just laughed away to start with. And it made me angry, it made me frustrated. I started drinking too much. I wasn't interested anymore, so to speak, until I found my, re found myself about five, six years ago. And I worked and I worked and I worked and I you know, be became richer here. I read a lot. I probably read, read about 150 books in the last five years. And it made me do this. Because I started giving lectures on SEMCO outside my organization. I wasn't, well, I wasn't happy being a police commissioner anymore. I was, I was happy doing this. But I stayed on because, well, of course, you, 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 know, you, have, you have the money issue. I did this for free. So I couldn't live on this, so I needed the job. And, and I, I stayed on and, and finally I got lucky because the chief of, of the police force where I work now was interested in this. I said, well, actually I follow your thinking, but I'm still skeptical if it's really possible to do this and blah, 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 okay. So in the long run, I got the right place in the right position. And that's because you don't give up at a certain moment in time. You just keep on going and, and growing and 
whatever. So that's a bit my story on how I sort of transformed a little. Now, I have two examples of companies that um, have done this and might be interesting to watch the videos. The first one is um, uh, Samco, as I, as I already talked about. So it's quite interesting. Good morning, Mr. Semler. Hi. Ricardo Semler neemt in de jaren 80 de machinefabriek van zijn vader over. Hij ontslaat drie kwart van de managers, schaft eigen kantoren en secretaresses af en heft de afdeling personeelszaken op. We said, uh, look, don't tell us anymore what time you came to work, what time you went home. Uh, we don't need to know that anymore. Uh, let's contract in a different way. Let's say how many of these are you going to sell, how many of these are you going to produce. And then, of course, we went further. We said, um, why can't people set their own salary? Het kwakkelende bedrijf met zo'n 4 miljoen dollar omzet groeit als kool en is nu goed voor zo'n 400 miljoen. We're talking about a company that for 30 years has grown 41% a year, has made 37% return on capital every year. So there's nothing to talk about from a business standpoint after 30 years. It's not a question whether it work, does it not? We nemen Semler mee naar de Zuidas, het financiële hart van Nederland. The whole headquarter rationale is completely obsolete. There's no reason whatsoever today for you to have central business. These are, these are issues that are connected to ego. ABN AMRO besluit hier vorige week het salaris van haar topbankiers met 20% te verhogen. When you look at the difference between the salaries of the average person who's out here having coffee and trying to go up in their lives and the people at the top, it's now 72 times. There was a time when it was three or four. We had a maximum of all of these 30 years. We had a maximum of three. Ricardo Semler. Hij werd verkozen tot Braziliaanse en Latijns-Amerikaanse zakenman van het jaar en schreef bestsellers over zijn methode. We said, set it up any way you want. You want to work four hours a day, six hours a day, ten. You want to work hard. You want to work. It doesn't matter. Do it any way you want because then we'll be sure you're doing what you want. And the chance is much higher that will get productivity out of you. People, adults like these, are tremendously responsible, tremendously able to make decisions. So when you say, look, I'm going to give you all the information you need to decide your salary, which is, what does everyone else in this building make? What does everybody make across in the other building, in other companies? Uh, what does the company make? What can it afford? You put that together and you're able to set your salary. I go there once a week, physically. Uh, for a half day. I don't have an office, I don't have a parking space. Depending on the factory I go, they don't let me in because they don't recognize. I think it, it is, we're living a, the last phase of a very obsolete form of organization. And uh, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 35, it's, it's getting, it's, it's, it's ending slowly. His people can decide anything. And actually, it's a function of the survival of the organization. When, the, when, the, when let's say, the, the economic times were sort of not that good, they even lowered their own wages and their bonuses. So for them, it's like, okay, the survival of the, of the, of the, of the company is much more important than what we actually make. Because why? Their purpose is actually linked to the purpose of the, of the organization. So... He let them get on with it. He does, as he said, he doesn't even get, uh, go there anymore. He's sort of the architect and he lets people get on with it. And they do a wonderful job, actually. Uh, the other one is Morningstar. I could probably show you about 20, but I have, don't have uh, time for that, of course. But uh, you can find a lot of this on, on the internet as well. Morningstar is a company in the US. I love working here at Morningstar. To me, it's unlike the government, you know. We have a lot of freedom here. I, I love this job. I plan on working here until I retire because it's so different. Self-management is, at a very, very high level, exactly the way you live when you go home from work. We just ask you to keep that hat on when you come to work at Morningstar. The Morningstar was founded in 1970 by Chris Roofer. He was, uh, at the time, a uh, college student at UCLA and uh, he leased his first truck, a, uh, a big rig, and started hauling tomatoes into and out of factories. And uh, over a few years of doing that, he kind of had some thoughts about how factories could be run. And in 1990, he started what was the Morningstar Packing Company's very first facility in Los Banos, California. We've grown since 1990 to uh, three very large facilities. Those facilities um, 
process about 40% of California's processed tomato crop. We are the largest processor of tomatoes in the world. So who's the boss? I think in a traditional organization, there's kind of a very rigid interpretation of who the boss is. We have no bosses here at Morningstar. I have no, no boss, so, well, every, everybody's a, basically a boss. When you come in on board at Morningstar, you and the colleagues around you are expected to kind of take a time out, sit down, examine yourself, your, your competencies, your, your, what you have to bring to the table, the things you're trying to achieve in your career and in your life, and to organize your work accordingly. And as long as you are achieving your mission and the enterprise is achieving their mission, there really aren't a whole lot of boundaries around how that works. And you really, what you're doing is you're working with other business units. You know, I may want to get something done on the operations side, so what I have to do is, not because I'm the so-called head of quality or whatever your job title would supposedly be, you need to go and you need to negotiate with another business unit, maybe it's the evaporation guys, and we need to negotiate, but at the end of the day, it's what's best for the company. We don't have a structured, uh structured hiring process. Here at Morningstar, as a group, as a family, we're involved and we make those decisions together. You hire the right people, you get the right person in the job, you don't need to micromanage them. There is no micromanaging here and, and it, it's, it's really a breath of fresh air to be honest with you. Politics as, as a kind of concept is probably the, or the absence thereof within Morningstar is probably the most interesting thing that most people notice almost immediately. You know, there, there's no kind of trying to climb the ladder or vying for resources that are kind of scarce and being doled out by somebody. All of us are free to, you know, buy what we need to buy to do our job right. It's not that there is unlimited funds, it's simply that you have the ability to expend the resources you need as long as you get the appropriate, you know, get people involved who have expertise and uh, are going to be affected by it. You have the ability to spend the money. If I need to spend $80,000 on a lab instrument, I buy the lab instrument. Um, in my other company, that doesn't fly. Uh, not only would I not get it, um, the, the process to get to that point is, is very difficult. The things that quash people are overwhelming bureaucracy and red tape, inability to do the things that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt are the things that need to be done. I think the people on the floor are probably the best ones to make the decisions, you know? We see it run, we've done the maintenance on it, we know more about it than anybody. Kind of fundamental to our way of doing things is that the person with the most insight, the most knowledge, should be the person making the decision. Period. End of story. Knowledge is what gets you respect here, not a job title. I could I cut it here. Otherwise, it? we're we're there for a lot of, for another five minutes or four, uh, four minutes. Um, but you can watch this total video uh, when you receive the Prezi link. So. Uh, won't be a problem. Now I, I'm going to focus a little on, on what we did in the police force in Leuven. Uh, this is our building, Ferry Teal. Not, of course. <laughs> it's built in the old way. Uh, let's say offices, you know, confinement and, and, you know. It's not my way of how I would organize a, a building, but okay. Uh, it was built, let's say, about 20, 25 years ago, and, and this wasn't really talk, uh, talk about, talkable uh, at that time. Um, but we're opening up. I mean, we get the chance in September to open up our offices. We are sort of still confined, but to open the space, and maybe we'll still have sort of two locations where people can sit in, in a quiet room which might also be necessary, of course. We, all, we also have, you, you notice the hammocks in, in the presentation, in the video of Samler. Um, we have a salon where people can take a power nap in the, after lunch, for instance, just to have their focus again after uh, one o'clock, for instance. Um, this is where I work. This is where I'm from. And I live here at the moment. So I have the best of flanners. Uh, this is Wallonia, this is Brussels, just to give you an idea where we are. Uh, this is what Leuven is best known for. Stella Artois, everybody knows that pr probably. <laughs> it's, in my opinion, not the best beer in the world, but nor is Carlsberg, so. <laughs> um, it's also known for a very old un university, one, probably one of the oldest in the world, but okay. Um, and ABN Bev is actually the largest um, the, comp the world's largest beer chain because they keep buying other beer companies all over the world. Um, and it has its seat in, in Leuven. Uh, this is our organizational chart, again, very teal, uh, with 
even confinement for general management to show who's the boss. Now, of course, we're trying to move away from that, uh, but it's still going to be take some time. And this is my unit, um, or our unit, I call it now, of course. But this is where I was put in as the head of the unit head, so to speak, as a commissioner. So we have layers of checking on people, uh, and this guy has a lot of um, power to decide. And yet he lets himself be advised by these people. And they're quite, some of them are very open, very co constructive, and other ones are very self, uh, how do you call this, self-preserving. Uh, their role and their function and their, so it's about a bit about ego, but that's okay. I mean, people don't really know anything else. I mean, they, they, they've been taught to do this as well. So my, my um, or our unit uh, does is a Bureau of Functional Information Management and Administration, which means that the reports that people, that our people need to make, uh, the, the officers on, on the street, uh, when there's crimes, when there's traffic viola violations, whatever, need all come to our cell, our, our unit, where we, um, I won't say check, because I don't like the word check and control anymore, but it's about we follow up if the quality is good enough uh, to send it out to the judicial department, for instance, if uh, it, it has the procedure there, uh, because, of course, we have certain procedures in place which are quite normal to do, um, and also if they're in time. So we sort of now coach people to make uh, more work of this, where we used to be the stepmother telling them this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. We sort of changed our ways of, think, uh, of thinking towards other people. So we've, we've changed our purpose, actually. Um, now, how did this happen? I call it the ripple effect because it's actually starting with one person putting a drop and then it starts uh, spreading. Uh, what is the drop that we put there is a ma as a manager, as a leader, as a... As a person in charge, so to speak, you don't do this anymore, but you do this. You become the waiter who carries the people, who supports the people in finding their own strengths, in finding their own leadership capacities, because that everybody can be a leader. I believe strongly that everybody has leadership inside. Some of them don't want it, that's okay. But most of them, once they get this responsibility, make a wonderful job out of it every day. So how did we do this? I looked for support to start with. Um, doing what I do, I was asked by the, by the chief, okay, how can you bring this inside this organization? How can you make it concrete? Well, actually, I reversed the question. I say, how do you make trust concrete? How do you make respect concrete? How do you make love concrete? How do you make win-win thinking concrete? It's not that tangible, but we can work on it constantly because it's an attitude, it's culture. It's not about the structure and the, the, the little boxes and whatever. It's about work in a very f working together in a very fluid way, leaving people to do their job that they already know how to do. You don't need to stand aside them and say, what are you doing? Are you doing it right? Blah, 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 as we did in the old days. So he followed me. And let's say he followed me. He's, he gave me the chance to sort of start this, well, at first, he, told, he, he, he said it was an experiment, but we've evolved towards that. You know? it, became, it started as an experiment, but be, it, it has become much more important than just an experiment or a project. Uh, when I started, um, there was four silos, four head tasks, and even physically, people were sitting in their own office, not looking at other people within this team. Uh, not asking, oh, how are you doing? Can I help you out? Whatever. So we took away that. We took away the, the idea of silos. They still have the four main tasks, but they keep looking at each other and say, hang on a minute, I have a bit less work. Maybe I can help you out. Even not knowing the systems altogether, but they're willing to help out wherever they can. So they, they also learned how to open up themselves up as a person talking about their kids, talking about the dog who might be you know, receiving a, a shot at a veterinarian and, and losing him, sharing their feelings and their purpose, their personal purpose, but also joining the purpose of, of, uh, of, the, of the team. Now, the second f step I did was talk to the middle management. I have three head inspectors uh, who were constantly checking on people and controlling people. So I sat down with them and said, look, um, what if we would 
change this whole idea and, and do it in a very more human-centric way and, and talk to people and let them be who they are. And you get the role of a coach instead of a controller. Actually, they were quite joyful to do that because they didn't like to control people. They didn't like to be angry and whatever. Now it's, it's become much more humane and, and jo enjoyable, so to speak. So they, they picked this up and, and started doing it. A bit skeptical at st to start with, which is quite normal, of course, because this is a totally new thing and what's going to happen, no? And then it's about inspiring the people in this team because they don't know anything different. The first question I got was, yeah, Erwin, this is quite nice what you're talking about, but uh, you make double the money that we do. So that for you, this is quite simple, no? You sit back and you do nothing. I said, well, I'm probably going to be working the hardest, but you won't notice it, because I'm going to protect you from the boundaries that we will bump into. I will make sure that this gets follow-up. I will make sure this and this and this and this, whatever. I will have your back. And that's why I'm here for what I'm here for. So now they have noticed this, and they don't, we don't talk of money anymore. It's not about the wages. And of course, I'm open to discuss if my wages are not too high compared to what they do. We don't even that, it doesn't even come into the picture anymore. But of course, you get this question. But it's about inspiring people, about being vulnerable yourself, and about being humble. Uh, at one moment in time, I moved my office from, a, from let's say, a place where there was no daylight. I only had aircon, airco, and uh, and uh, you know this this artificial light. And two of the people of the team said to me at a certain moment, "Why don't you go uh, to that office? There's place there. There's only one person sitting there, so might be better because at least he can open a window and stuff." So I assumed, from the old way of thinking, of course that these two people had suggested this and the rest would be okay. And I didn't communicate about my move, so I started filling boxes, put it in, in, in the other office, and then I, I just sat there. And after about two, three weeks, I could feel that the, there was a lot of tension. So I said, what's happening here? I didn't know anything, so people didn't dare to talk to me even. Because we didn't, this was still quite early in, in, in the whole after the whole start. Uh, so at a certain moment in time, I was called into this meeting. And uh, they said, well, actually, you have wonderful ideas, but uh, you don't live up to them yourself. And I said, okay, you want to sort of... And in the back of my mind, I already knew what it was about, of course, but okay. So they told me, we have no problem with you moving, but you didn't talk to us. Why didn't you tell us that you were going to do this? Because this is part of what we are now. And I could only say, well, you're right. You're totally right. I am totally wrong in this, and I should have talked to you. So I put myself in a very humble place. I, I made myself very hum uh, um, uh, vulnerable and, you know, said, well, I really appreciate that you, that you talked to me about this because, uh, you know, I can only hope that, I in, that in future I don't make the same mistake. So this is a learning curve for me as well. And actually, the most skeptical person that actually had put this forward, this, this problem forward, came in that way, came on board and said, well, actually, now I can see that you really mean it, so I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go with it. And that's actually what helps, what inspires people. Then we looked for our why, which is not, which is not that easy to do, because a lot, a lot of people talk about what and about how, but the why, why are we here? Why, why, why are we part of this organization? Now, what is our role here? What is our mission? Of course, after a while they found it. It's about delivering uh, good support, excellent support actually, towards other, other people in, in, in our organization, also outside. Um, and it doesn't have to be stated like, like a thing on the wall, you know, our, our mission statement. That's not what it's about. It's living it every day. And we had a dialogue, not this way, of course. Um, but we talked about what is it you want to change? What is it you find okay and very nice, but what is it you want to change in future and, and how, you, how do you want to develop this further? And we listened to their ideas and, and you know, and they, they actually could decide themselves what, which ideas were more, were more important, let's say prioritize and then get, get on with it. Uh, and it was also to, about making a framework. That's the next step that we did. We made a framework made by themselves uh, talking about the values that connected them, 
like humor, for instance. Who would think of humor as a value to connect people? Of course it connects people. Now, there, there's banter there every day. They, they joke with each other, they tease each other a bit, and it's wonderful. It's, a, it's a, quite a joyful place to come into. And of course, there's still work there. Don't worry, it, it, it gets, still gets done, but in, in a much more pleasant way. So to have, this val to have these values that connect you, you need to trust. And, and you also need to be able to talk about the, value, the, the, the actions that follow on the values that are promotable, but also the ones that might be a little bit put, putting pressure on, on your values. And now they have learned how to talk about this in an open way. Uh, transparent communication is, is, of course, one of the, the points that helps to this, open communication. We had a session where we, we listened to people how hard this would be, open communication. And we actually are taught from, from childhood that we shouldn't talk back to people. We shouldn't say what we think because, and actually, why shouldn't we? I feel more hurt if people be talk behind my back and say nothing to me than if they would say it to my face, because at least I can do something about it. But we are not, learn we are not taught that way, we are not conditioned in that way, are we? And then they started self-organizing a lot of things, like uh, days off, of course, that's the first thing they think about. Uh, but they do that themselves, they, they concur with each other, okay, they, they know that there's need to, there need to, needs to be four people at least in the, within the team, so about 16 can go and leave. As long as one person is there to do every task, it's okay. And they concur with each other, and sometimes one, one takes over from another and whatever. Uh, that that's only one example. Now, they, the last uh, two weeks ago, we had a selection, selection procedure for, for like uh, new, can, new uh, colleagues, and they decided who they, who they wanted in their team. Not me anymore, because I won't work with, 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 this, with these new per uh, people as much as they will. And I still had my say, like, okay, I feel, that, and actually it was quite uh, astonishing how easy we found the same, we had the same feeling about people. There's also a lot of room for feedback. Uh, we sit each, we sit, well, uh, I, I don't always join, but uh, they sit together, um, they used to sit together every day, now they sort of downsize this to once a week or whenever it's necessary. When one person says, well, I think we should sit together on this and this and this, they go. They just do it. And there's a lot of talk without getting angry, for instance. What is the results up to now? Um, I will let, let two people of my team uh, talk to you about this because I interviewed them. It's quite low budget. It's done with uh, a normal camera that you can, you know, a digital camera. Um, but at least, at least it gives you an idea on how they feel about this because I can tell you whatever I want. No? <laughs> Ik vond dat een, uh, op zijn minst gezegd een opmerkelijk initiatief, um, aangezien dat wij toch wel bij uitstek binnen een hiërarchisch gestructureerde organisatie werken, was ik op zijn minst gezegd uh, zeer sceptisch over de slaagkansen van dat project. Dus is one of the middle Daarom, managers? Ja, omdat dat tenminste van, allee, op het eerste zicht vrij haaks staat op, op ja, hoe we al sinds decennia werken binnen de politie. Mm -hmm. Ik had enkele weken ervoor een aflevering op tv gezien van een fabriek in Brazilië waar de werknemers ook zelfsturend waren. En dat principe dat beviel mij heel erg. Ik keek daar uh, wel naar uit. Ja, ik had daar een positief gevoel bij. Mm -hmm. Dus eerst vooral de leiding, ja, dat was zeer traditioneel uh, georganiseerd, uh, directief, controlerend. Um, dan qua, qua groepsdynamiek, uh, ik meen te mogen zeggen dat we te maken hadden met een vrij apathische groep. Dus uh, de mensen ondergingen wat er van bovenaf werd opgelegd. Het werk werd uitgevoerd en aan de oppervlakte was de sfeer ogenschijnlijk goed, maar dan merk je op een bepaald moment toch dat er onderhuids spanningen zijn. Spanningen die allicht uh, bevorderd werden door het feit dat we ook niet echt één groep vormden, maar verschillen, verschillende kleine celletjes. Mm -hmm. En de mensen hadden ja, zo'n perceptie 
waardoor dat er wantrouwen, onderling wantrouwen uh, heerste. Mm-hmm. Um, eigenlijk werden alle beslissingen boven ons hoofd genomen en het werd medegedeeld aan ons en wij moesten het dan uitvoeren. Eigen inspraak of eigen inbreng was er eigenlijk heel weinig. En naar de, de groep toe, de sfeer, ja, de mensen kenden elkaar niet echt goed, dus de sfeer was ook niet zo optimaal. Er waren ook veel conflicten die sluimerden, die niet uitgesproken werden, dus er was veel ruimte voor verbetering. Wel, je voelt dat die sfeer helemaal is omgeslagen, dus ik denk dat we mogen zeggen dat de mensen elkaar veel, veel meer vertrouwen. Uh, er wordt ook veel meer gecommuniceerd, zowel over uh, werkgerelateerde zaken als over uh, koetjes en kalfjes. En dat, dat is uiteraard zeer bevorderlijk voor de, voor de atmosfeer. Heel positief eigenlijk. De mensen hebben elkaar beter leren kennen. Er wordt meer gepraat. Er is ook ruimte om, om andere dingen uh, te doen, om eens, uh, iets anders te doen van werk. Of, of is, uh, meer een betere sfeer in de mm-hmm. Wel, bijvoorbeeld, vroeger uh, dienden de mensen hun verlof te laten goedkeuren door de leidinggevende. Um, dan hebben wij op een bepaald moment afgesproken dat ze voortaan zelf hun verlof mogen inbrengen. Uh, uiteraard na samenspraak met de collega's. Hè. En tot op de dag van vandaag werkt dat zeer goed. Mm-hmm. We hebben ook een uh, overlegmoment uh, in het leven geroepen. Dat hoeft niet dagdagelijks te gebeuren, maar wanneer dat er iets is, dat, uh, wanneer iemand van oordeel is dat er iets moet besproken worden, dan wordt uh, de groep zeer spontaan samengeroepen en dan gaan we samen zitten. Mm-hmm. Er wordt, uh, sinds kort worden er uh, om half tien, is er een kleine koffiepauze. Zo'n koffiepauze en dan worden er afspraken gemaakt of, of er worden mededelingen gegeven. En er kan ook al eens gepraat worden, dus er kunnen ook uh, problemen uitgepraat worden. En dat is wel heel bevorderlijk voor de sfeer. Wel, wat, wat voor mij in het begin misschien een beetje moeilijk was, is, was om, om, om los te laten. Uh, dus ja, je moet binnen zelfsturing uiteraard de mensen de kans geven om zelf bepaalde initiatieven te nemen, om zelf beslissingen te nemen. Dus je moet voor een stukje loslaten. Um, en ja, toch ook wel um, ja, gaan meedenken met, met waar we als groep naartoe willen, terwijl dat je vroeger ja, je eigenlijk volledig kon focussen op, op je eigen ding. Dus dat is toch ook wel een aanpassing. Het moeilijkste was eigenlijk um, communicatie. Om dingen uit te praten en dingen te benoemen zoals ze zijn, dat, uh, dat was voor iedereen wel het moeilijkste. Mm-hmm. Mm, eerst en vooral um, denk ik dat een organisatie zich toch moet bewust zijn van het gegeven dat uh, dat het kader uh, in orde moet zijn. Daarmee bedoel ik, uh, de randvoorwaarden moeten oké okay zijn alvorens dat je met zo'n project kunt starten. Of, of tenminste alvorens dat je uh, kunt zeggen dat je optimale slaagkansen geeft aan het project. Bijvoorbeeld uh, personeelstekort. Het zal nog altijd een personeelstekort zijn bij zelfsturing. Dus dan hypothekeer je voor een stukje de slaagkansen van het project als je daar op voorhand niks aan doet. Mm-hmm. Ook voor de, de leidinggevende of de coaches, zoals we het dan binnen zelfsturing uh, benoemen, die moeten zich ook ervan bewust zijn dat zij een andere positie moeten innemen. Dat ze echt tussen de mensen moeten gaan staan om, om op dagdagelijkse basis ondersteuning te kunnen geven. Mm-hmm. Uh, de grootste valkuil is dat die communicatie wat verwatert. Dus dat, de, dat, dan niet echt meer, dat er minder uh, moeite ingestoken wordt en dat er minder gecommuniceerd wordt, dan dat is wel uh, het grootste probleem. Mm-hmm. Ja, dat ze uiteraard zelf moeten het voorbeeld geven als, uh, als ze willen dat hun, hun project geloofwaardig overkomt naar de medewerkers, dan, dan moeten zij zelf uh, het voorbeeld geven. Uh, absoluut uh, tussen de mensen gaan staan en heel veel communiceren met de mensen. 
Ja, we nemen vooral tijd om uh, mensen te leren, te leren kennen en hun goede en mindere kantjes te leren kennen. Dan weet je ook hoe dat ze best kunnen gemotiveerd worden. Neem er tijd voor, wees geduldig en heb er vertrouwen in. Mm -hmm. Ik kom met een ander gevoel werken, absoluut. De, de, de sfeer is nu eenmaal veel, veel beter. Uh, dus ja, dat is prettig. Als je dan uh, s maandags, zelfs maandags uh, is dat dan te pruimen om, om naar het werk te komen. Okay. Ja. Dank u wel voor uw medewerking. Dat is graag gedaan. Ik kom uh, veel liever werken, ja. Oké, okay. dank u wel. Uh, as you could see, this was uh, taped in uh, in April uh, this year, just before I went to Hungary to uh, to present our our example to uh, the IEC uh, Integral European Conference. Um, and since then, we have of course um, evolved a bit further. Now, the next triple is the commitment by top management, and I have about five weeks ago I received this in a very positive way, um, where I was sort of asking, okay, we're getting there, so now what, you know, what are we going to do next to make this bigger and, and make it much more stronger within our, our organization, our total organization. And then the, the chief said to me, well, actually, um, I've seen that it worked now. I'm quite, I was already quite positive, but I, I really see that it, uh, that it works and I want to move away from a hierarchical organization to a teal network organization. So I was like, is he really saying this? He even used the word teal. <laughs> okay, I was sort of, first I was like sort of flabbergasted a bit, but after a while I went like, oh yes, he really has, has you know, he knows what it's about and, and that's good. And okay, it's going to be a long way. We're, we're not there. Uh, about 70% of my colleagues, senior officers, are quite open to this. Maybe not all, always fully, and that's okay. They need to sort of evolve themselves in this as well. I can't expect after five or six years of, of studying this and, and being, you know, looking for examples in, in this, that they are on the same level. Or if you want to talk levels, of course. I'm not, I don't want to talk levels. It's about me crossing a bridge and maybe being in, in a quarter of it and they still standing there. So I might have to return and take them with me if they want to. If they don't want to, I leave them and I say, okay, that's okay too. So about 30% might be very ego-driven and very rank and title and whatever and look at what I have achieved and um, I think you can't achieve anything without your people, but okay. Um, so we will have discussions and we will have clashes once in a while and I will have to kick shins, which I already do, in protecting my people. That's part of it. It's like a growing curve and it's like sometimes even two steps forward and one back and even sometimes even two back where he might take a different turn somehow. But we're there. I mean, in that sense that he wants to broaden it up. And I've even asked him, have you got any idea if we succeed in this? And we will. I'm very convinced of this. What impact that could have, influence that could have on other f police forces. Tomorrow I'm talking to police in Malmö because they knew I was here and they sort of said, well, maybe we should listen to this guy. Wonderful, of course, no? And I know that your police force is in a bit of turmoil at this moment in time. So um, maybe it can help a little bit to convince people to go this way because I know that there's already some people there that want to do it this way. Um, so it, we're going to have a long run. We're just beginning. We're just the pioneers, so to speak. So it's still quite a long road, but for me, uh, there's only actually one thing that I have in mind, and that's this, never give up. No matter what, how high the wall is you have to climb, you never give up, because you've started something, and you can't take people with you to then say, okay, now I'm leaving and get on with it. It doesn't work that way. That's actually the question that they have asked me, knowing what I'm doing, that this might be come quite successful and that I might leave the, the, the company, so to speak. Uh, that's their fear. And I have sort of made their a promise, which I will uphold, as long as I can do this and mix this, be a commissioner, entitled, whatever, uh, and doing this in my or own organization and having this mix, because this mix also opens doors, no? I mean, 
If I wouldn't have this example, I might not even be here unless to support the Teal for Teal community. I wouldn't be presenting this, possibly. So it, it's a mix which m makes a lot of things happen and, and a lot of things possible. So I can give you only one advice. If you start this, never give up. How high it, it, this wall gets that you have to face. Uh, leadership is not about flow charts and about rank and about titles and whatever else. It's not about ego. It's about influencing your, your environment, yourself to start with, with your with, with positive attitude and, and, posit and uh, influencing people in, in a positive way. You know? uh, a bit of about, very short about Teal for Teal International. Um, I'm, I'm one of the, the two uh, international stewards, so I, I get this chance to travel to other countries and, and support people who have started a group. Um, on Tuesday, I had a Zoom call with a group in Oregon, on the west coast of the US. Uh, who, which have invited me to go there next year. I will probably go to Australia even uh, next year to do a tour there. Uh, I'm going to Prague, I'm going to Berlin, I'm going to Warsaw. Um, so many <laughs> coming at this moment. I'm going to Zurich, um, Belgrade, Sofia, and, and, and. So it's quite nice to do this, but I, need to, I needed to ask my, my chief to have a bit of extra time off <laughs> to do this. But we've, we started this in, well, let's say, Philippines, and, and Ernst started this in, in Switzerland in May 2015. And quite shortly after that, I talked to Philippines because I had similar ideas in connecting the dots. Um, it, it actually was set up to, to unify a little bit more the consultants and coaches and trainers that are out there trying to uh, assist in, in organizational development. Uh, also because, because these two people that founded it were coaches themselves. Now, I'm not a coach. I'm an internal innovator, as I call it. So I've tried to open it up to CEOs, managers, whatever, whoever else is interested to spread this, so to speak. Not in by convincing people, but by planting seeds and trying to inspire people. Um, so we're now in about uh, 16, even probably more, more now, 17 uh, countries. We have about f up to 40 groups. Some of them very vibrant. We have six in Flanders alone. Um, they are getting, uh, they're getting there together every month. We have two very vibrant here in, in Sweden, uh, Malmö and, and uh, Stockholm. Um, and we, we're, we're growing, we're constantly growing. So it's quite nice to see this happen. Uh, we set out to do this, but you never know how it's gonna turn. But you know, the attention is there. And uh, my job here is to support the people that pull this, uh, to, to get attention a bit and, and say, okay, look, this, this is what we can really do for each other. We can really connect and grow in this and, and give more information on this, on how to do this. So that's actually what we're about. So uh, the next question is, how about you? When are you starting? Or when maybe you already have started and you have an example of yourself. Why not? You know? might be very interesting. And then, of course, you can talk to, to Anna about that. Uh, this is my, uh, my information. And I have quite a number of groups that I've set up over the years uh, just to, to communicate to people. So I'm up for questions. Thank you. <laughs>